Sup, y'all? And welcome to Economic Development and Globalization, Part 4. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at uneven development within states and ask this essential question. How does development occur in the periphery and why is it imbalanced? To illustrate the role globalization plays in development and production, we will look at the making of a t-shirt with information from a website developed by NPR's Planet Money. If you want to investigate further, you can check out the site using this URL right here. The journey begins with the production of cotton on a farm in Mississippi. Since this is in the U.S., it is a modern farm with top-end machinery, including the John Deere combine you see here. Equipped with GPS guidance, it mostly drives itself. Furthermore, most American farms are typically subsidized by the U.S. government to maintain steady production and for the farmers not to overproduce, causing a glut in the market, driving prices down. This map shows the production of upland cotton in 2010. Now, this is the most common type of cotton in the U.S., which originated in Mexico. That said, more than 90% of the cotton produced in the U.S. are GMOs. In this example, the raw cotton is transported to two countries to be processed into cloth and the shirts themselves. One of these countries is Bangladesh. This country works well primarily due to its very low labor cost and infrastructure specialized for the garment industry. Recall that when comparing country data, it helps to look at a wide range of indicators, but especially those that show if a population is healthy, wealthy, and wise. So, looking at the country data for Bangladesh, along with its population pyramid, you can see it ranks in the bottom half for life expectancy and toward the global floor in per capita income. Taking all indicators into consideration, Bangladesh ranks as a least developed country, or LDC for short. Colombia is the other country, primarily because of its proximity to the U.S. and because of its relatively low labor cost. So, looking at the country data for Colombia, Along with its population pyramid, you can see its per capita income ranking in the bottom half of the world, and even though it is better in terms of health, wealth, education, and urbanization, it still ranks as an LDC. This chart compares minimum wages across the top 10 garment exporting countries in 2013. Even though Colombia isn't actually in the top 10, it is included for this particular example. However, you can see Bangladesh has the lowest wages of all countries on this chart. And looking at this graph, which shows textile exports as a country's total manufacturing exports, it is no surprise the UK had the early start. However, once Japan industrialized, they became a major exporter of textiles, primarily due to their cheap labor and improvements in transport technology through the use of steamships. You can see some of this data only began in 1980, around the start of the post-Fordist era and the beginnings of the new international division of labor. China's exports were mostly textiles into the 1990s, but since then, China has diversified greatly. Looking at Bangladesh currently, you can see around 90% of all their exports are textiles. Of course, this is all possible through a plethora of technologies, but containerization is one of the most important factors. And breaking down the production cost of getting the shirt to the market, the cost of container shipping was only around 7 cents per shirt. This is a fraction of the cost of the raw materials, totaling around 60 cents per shirt. The design printing was 90 cents, and final packaging and delivery from port to store via trucks was the most expensive at $2.70 a shirt. So this is just one example that illustrates how and why the global division of labor, while complex in nature, is the most efficient way to produce goods at the maximum profit. Throughout the developing world, islands of development are formed by governments or corporations to attract foreign direct investment through constructing improved infrastructure and attracting abundant new jobs. It is simpler and less expensive to develop certain cities rather than spread development more evenly throughout the entire country. Additionally, most leaders want to showcase their capitals as signs of their productivity and progress toward development. In some instances, countries have established a forward capital, which is a city designated as a new capital for some national goal, whether over contested land, some historic location, or to aid in development and even provide more centripetal forces for cultural purposes. For instance, Brazil's capital used to be Rio de Janeiro. Most of the population, as well as wealth and development, was located in this southern section. 
So to relieve population pressure in that area and to help develop more of the interior, in 1960, they finished construction of Brasilia, a new capital built from the ground up. All told, while it is Brazil's seat of government, it has had meager success in spreading the population and development. Another example is Nigeria, whose capital used to be what is still their largest city, Lagos, located in the largely Christian area in the south. Abuja, a new city planned from scratch, was finally constructed in 1991, located in a more central and neutral place. Similar to Brasilia, it was designated to relieve population pressure and help develop more of the interior. And also similar to Brazil, Nigeria has had minor success in achieving these goals. Of course, not all forward capitals are built from the ground up. Many are already existing cities. This is the case with Pakistan, whose capital used to be Karachi, located adjacent to the Arabian Sea. Due to conflicts with India, they designated Islamabad as their new capital in 1960, strategically chosen due to its proximity to the contested Kashmir region, and also since Karachi is vulnerable to attack from ship bombardment. One last example is actually a potential forward capital in South Korea. Seoul is their current capital, and attempts have been made to designate Gangju as their new capital, since it is further south and may help with more even development and population distribution. Also, not coincidentally, Gangju is outside of North Korea's artillery fire range. In order to generate more growth in the periphery, and especially in the poorest regions of these countries, NGOs play a key role. Generally run as nonprofits, many seek to help people in areas with minimal opportunity to help themselves, such as Doctors Without Borders, in which over 30,000 people, mostly doctors and nurses, provide free services in over 70 countries. The goal of many NGOs is to engage the locals in participatory development, where they have a major say in deciding what development means for them and determine how it should be achieved. People from rich countries may have grandiose plans to help out poorer villages, but the locals know their own needs better than outsiders. So, while a granary converted to a solar-powered TV hut may be entertaining, as seen here in Niger, many people still gather water directly from swamps and streams, making it easier to contract waterborne illnesses, in addition to sometimes being located miles away. Aiding villagers in building a well could have a much more profound impact on development, as you see here in Uganda. In this way, NGOs can be counter-hegemonic. Now, a hegemon is a nation that dominates other nations, economically, politically, or culturally, as in the United States. By aiding and engaging people to help themselves, they gain more independence. Microcredit programs have seen great success in places like South America and South Asia. Since people in these parts of the world often have no credit rating to speak of, which is even more true for women, some NGOs loan poor people small amounts of money to support their families or start small businesses. An example is Grameen Bank, founded in Bangladesh. This woman here is feeding her cattle using money from a microcredit loan from that bank. With high repayment rates, these programs have been quite successful. However, in places with high mortality rates from diseases such as malaria or HIV AIDS, the success rates are understandably lower. Sick people cannot work effectively, and money has to be diverted to care for them. Furthermore, funeral expenses for the dead are an economic drain, not to mention the psychological trauma of losing a loved one. In many cases, peripheral economies are unstable. As a result, there are thousands of local currency exchanges throughout the world in which members of a local community are able to trade services or goods in a local network separated from the formal economy. A typical setup is where you would receive 11 of the local bills for 10 national bills. This incentivizes people to use the local currency and keep more of their money spent in their area. In turn, the vendors can exchange the local bills for actual currency at a participating bank. These currencies can also be used in the core, in particularly liberal regions where people are more anti-globalist and prefer to live more locally, as in the Berkshires, Massachusetts, or in East Sussex, UK. And perhaps all of you have experienced the local currency at Chuck E. Cheese's, where you can exchange real money for tokens that can only be used in their establishments. Well, la de frickin' do!